Yeah, so I was here about a year ago, uh, talking a little bit about light fields and VR. Um, just a curiosity, who was here last year? Oh, well, pretty small percentage. All right, great. So uh, the review part's going to be very brief, and you'll all be completely lost. Um, light fields in the future video. My premise behind this is a lot of the stuff that's going on in the edge of VR and AR right now is actually kind of an antecedent for what might happen to traditional video in the future. So uh, if it's not in here, it's probably not in the future. So pay attention. Um, yeah, at, at a high level, uh, there's a lot of interesting technologies that are powering these new displays, right? VR and AR. Um, the main difference between uh, content for these displays and content for tr traditional screen is that they're functionally holographic. If the user moves around, walks around, they expect to see something different. Uh, and if they do, uh, then it works well, and that's, that's holographic. It's my contention that TVs are going that way too, your phone, your laptop, everything's going to be holographic. So that's kind of why this stuff is really interesting and, and why you know, a cutting edge video technologists should probably be paying attention. Um, however, tech is still really young, and that's another good reason to be paying attention. Um, the majority of the content out there that's uh, holographic is either uh, based on polygons, Okay, actually, it's all based on polygons. Um, and then there's a little bit of light field stuff, which is like what my company is working on. Um, and as of a year ago, there were basically no standards. I think I stood up here and went on at length. Oh, standards, slow, it's never going to happen. Okay, so since then, there's been a few, a few developments. Uh, if you've been paying attention, a little tiny startup down in Mountain View kind of got acquired by Google. Uh, that was Lytro. Um, my company actually did produce a functional light field, which is like news. Um, I think I showed a really artifacty version last year. This is a fly-through of a virtual scene using light fields. So the whole scene is cinematic. It looks correct, uh, but it's from a virtual camera position. So that sort of means it's, it's holographic. Found that fairly exciting. A little startup down in Mountain View called Google uh, released a little light field demo, some uh, GoPros spinning around in a circle. Uh, if you have a VR headset and you haven't checked this out, you really should. It's actually really, really cool. Um, so that's light fields. Uh, I think a year ago I was joking about, no, I'm sorry, a month ago I was joking that there's absolutely no standards in light fields, that it's just kind of a hilarious concept, a light field standard. Come on, are you kidding me? Then I went down to San Diego to a JPEG Pleno committee meeting and they set a standard for light fields. Uh, Microsoft opened up a holographic capture studio in Seattle and here in San Francisco. I think there's one in LA maybe, um, which is kind of interesting. Intel spent, I think, 0.1 giga dollars on their own holographic capture studio down in LA. Uh, I still haven't seen any content out of it yet, but things are happening. So all these technologies are, are starting to, to, to be developed, you know, these tiny companies like Intel and Microsoft and Google. Um, and so it's, it's you know, starting to get some momentum. It's still obscure, it's still weird, but it's starting to happen. So, so the punchline from last year up to about now, uh, light fields are happening. Uh, rest in peace, Lytro, we'll miss you. Uh, hello to Microsoft and Intel, um, and some standards are starting to form. So that's, that's kind of the high-level view. Um, and, and the standards thing is really bizarre to me, by the way, because um, they don't really work yet, and so the idea that we're going to standardize on them is, is kind of odd. So and that's kind of what we're going to... I'm going to kind of use that as a jumping-off point. So why do we have video standards? It seems like an odd question for a group of video technologists, right? Like, because that's what we build, that's what we do. Um, but, but what is the function of a standard, right? Uh, at, at a high level, like a decoder is kind of a contract. Like I promise that if someone's running this compliant thing, it'll, it'll, it'll give them the right pixels out the other side, right? Um, uh, of course, that's not always true. Uh, if you ever sit next to a colorist when they're watching something play back, they get very frustrated. Um, we also do it, frankly, for compression, right? We want to be able to have smaller bit rates and move things around. Uh, and, and ultimately, we do it because uh, the standard is important for setting uh, uh, hardware acceleration, right? If you want to burn something on silicon, you better be sure it's going to work for the next couple of years. And that, to me, is kind of the, the core of why we would set a standard. Uh, there is an alternative, which I'd say in this sort of app store environment is what we have, where your, your payload, your data, gets bundled with whatever it takes to interpret that data, and they just get sent down on their own. Uh, you know, arbitrary executables, and that, that works just totally fine uh, for certain kinds of content, right? So if you don't need consistency, if you don't need compression, and you don't need efficiency caused by hardware acceleration, then that's a pretty good model, because um, we all know that that's why we program in high-level languages, right? So we can make changes and not have to worry about these uh, dense, low-level low level problems. Okay, so if, if that's kind of the logic behind a standard, and that's kind of the alternative, why are we starting to set standards for these new video formats that no one's using yet? It's a good question. Um, so to, to kind of interrogate that a bit, I'm going to kind of look at the, the, the interesting things we take for granted in 2D video that maybe aren't quite as true in this new, uh, new format, okay? 
So you know, we've fixed rasters. We only have to do interpolation if you're changing the scale of something. Uh, we start with ground truth. It doesn't often come up when you're doing video. Like, what's ground truth, right? That's like a, like a research thing. Um, we do get artifacts generally from compression. We don't assume we get artifacts otherwise. Uh, and finally, a pixel is a pixel. None of these are actually true in these new formats, okay? So fixed raster in a video. Get another video here. An immersive video, there is no fixed raster. If someone's got a VR headset on, they're like wandering around. As they move around, the mapping between the pixels in the display and the pixels in your data uh, changes. So that causes some really, really weird effects. You know, someone could just turn their head and now you've got these, you know, beat frequencies and stuff. So we don't have fixed rasters. Um, in fact, part of the standard is something called uh, free viewpoint TV, which that alone just kind of sounds very strange. Um, 2D video, we have to interpolate if we want to rescale. That's pretty common, not a big deal. In these new standards, you actually interpolate every single pixel you draw, every single one. It is a fully interpolated environment if you're in sixth off. And I kind of I want to emphasize this again, right? There's no like, okay, I've got a pixel and it's in the data in there and we can go light up a pixel on, a, on the screen. Like, you have to be running something to interpolate absolutely every pixel because you don't know where the person's going to be standing, you don't know where they're going to be. A tiny asterisk there, if you have a holographic TV, in theory you have a fixed 4D raster. In practice, uh, it's super large, so you're still interpolating basically every pixel. Um, likewise, uh, we don't have ground truth. Uh, and that sounds a bit odd. If you think of a 2D image, you kind of know what each pixel is. That's all you care about. When we get into these immersive content, uh, whatever we end up displaying is pretty either synthesized or fake or interpolated, right? So in a volumetric space where you've got polygons, you're kind of running a game engine, you're really far from reality at that point, right? It's a, you know, this kind of weird proxy for how the world works. And, and then you can get fidelity on top of that and do well or do, do poorly, um, but it's, it's already kind of not real. With light fields, well, in theory, it's photographic. It's, a, it's as real as the pixels in a regular camera, but as you can see from this like, inset of this array of cameras here, um, there's gaps between them. So if you want the light rays that fell in between cameras, you're now interpolating again. So in practice, uh, you don't actually know what you're trying to reconstruct. It's more like, um, like a sensing problem than it is like traditional video. And you can already start to see why this is kind of not great foundations for a video codec, but you know, maybe that's just my bias. Um, yeah, that, that, that frowny face is because we don't have ground truth. Um, see, Emma, like, I'm using emoticons and stuff. Where are you, Emma? I'm very, very hip now. I kindly get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> artifacts, okay, so the artifacts we get in 2D video typically are from compression, right? So if you throw enough bits away, we just deal with compression artifacts. I in these new formats, the artifacts are actually from the underlying representation. Like, you do as well as you can, and it's still going to look kind of weird and creepy. Uh, this is from 8i, by the way. Uh, I think they're still around. I'm kind of losing track of who's, like, dead and who's just wounded. Um, uh, that doesn't look real to me. So you see the edges of the hair, how it's kind of, like, chunky? I don't know if you call it an artifact or just like chunky, but yeah, it doesn't look good to me. And unfortunately, you can't get any better than that with that data representation, right? So this is a polygon-based image. Um, there's a you know, video, basically a game engine running, and there's this polygon figure there that's skinned with pixels. And no matter what you do, you're going to have chunky hair because that's the, rep the data representation is that shape. Um, okay, so this is a little weird one. Pixel is a pixel, right? Obviously, you start with a pixel, uh, you do some math, on one end, hand the data off to someone else. They do some math. You get a pixel out the other side. That's pretty, that's pretty great. Um, for all of these new immersive formats, it's not quite that simple. You've got a bunch of garbage going in there. It's you know, parametric data. It's polygons. It's maybe there's some pixels somewhere and some weird shader running. And then out the other side, you finally get a pixel. Um, and that's very, very different. Uh, you have the, the output is pixels lighting up in a screen. Maybe they're holographic pixels on a panel. Um, but the underlying data itself is not a direct map to that. OK. So again, I. I why did I go down to San Diego and listen to people talk about setting standards? What on earth is the reason for it? Well, uh, if you've ever seen video games running on different platforms, you know that consistency is really not the issue. You're not going to get consistency out of these things. Maybe, but probably not. Um, compression is really necessary, so that's good that we're worried about standards for compression. And, and there is some compressibility here. Uh, efficiency. This is the main reason we need a standard, I think. Uh, these file sizes, if you downloaded the Google, like, Welcome to Light Fields, it's... Uh, I think it's like seven or eight images, and I think it's like about eight or ten gigabytes. I mean, it's like about ballpark. Uh, so we need to do something to make these things more compressible. We need to do something to make them more efficient to decode, right? I think you have to have some super high-end graphics card to basically play back seven or eight still images, right? So I, Moore's Law is not going to save you at that point. You've got to do a little better. Fortunately, I think they're probably working on it. Um, and this is just a little generic graphic I Google image searched, uh, you know, kind of showing that if you want to do it in CPU, you're going to be spending, obviously, a lot of, a lot of resources. GPU is a little better. 
um, and eventually you want to get to A6 if you want this to really cook, right? We're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, running this all on CPU forever. For example, um, if you run the back of the envelope calculation on what it's going to take to make a holographic TV at scale, the number I've heard is you need about 50 billion holographic pixels. That is a lot of pixels to light up. And if you do it in CPU, um, this isn't my calculation, but an engineer I was talking to said, you'd, you'd at least run through about 30 or 40 kilowatts of power. So you're pretty much just going to burn down people's houses if you try to, try to run these things in CPU. That's probably why we need a standard. We've got to find a way to burn these algorithms on silicon so we're not just like, lighting fires everywhere. OK, so, so that's the motivation. Um, the standards today are a little, a little odd. So on the volumetric side, it makes a lot of sense. People have been doing video game engines for a while. Um, they've been doing VFX for a while. And a couple of companies are kind of pushing these standards forward, taking open source or well-established industry uh, container formats and, and image formats, and trying to wrap them up into a spec. It's basically, as far as I can tell, it's a whole lot of documentation, right? Because things that are being used uh, aren't necessarily documented the way you'd expect of a standard. Um, on the flip side, there's just game engines out there. They're, they're almost like the App Store model. You know, you go make an app and you like push it down into a VR headset and the Unity or Unreal, whatever the game engine is, kind of becomes your decoder on the fly. Um, so that's sort of the non-standard standard, but it's, it's the de facto standard for now. Uh, life field standards are still kind of hilarious to me. But, and, and, and here's why, frankly. Um, the, the current standard that's being discussed uh, in these standards bodies, JPEG, MPEG, I'm not sure what SMPTE's doing, but you know, they're, they're all basically doing the same thing. They are taking big arrays of images, because that's how you shoot a light field right now. Big array of cameras. Um, that's an array we built uh, down at Radiant Images in LA, 40, 48 cameras. And you shoot video on all of them, and then you process those video frames into a light field. The proposal that we're seeing is to basically treat the redundancy between cameras as a uh, time domain compression, right? So you got some P frames in the corners, you do some IMB frames in between, and you can reconstruct these things. You know, we've, we've heard this for a while, but now it's sort of like making its way into the, the mainstream standards bodies discussion. It's nice because it's familiar, right? I mean, you got people sitting there talking about DCTs again. It's all very straightforward. Um, and then there's also polygon data that comes along with it. And that's a little counterintuitive. It's like, well, I thought that was volumetric. Why do I need polygons and all these images? And the reason is, is kind of funny. It's an interpolative model, right? You need to interpolate light rays one way or another because you don't have 30 billion pixels or 50 billion pixels in that camera array. So no matter what you're playing it back on, you're going to be doing lots and lots and lots of interpolation. The problem is that if the light ray falls between cameras, the way you interpolate it is probably from using the raw images, right? Now, if you do a naive interpolation, you look for the closest light rays in 4D space, right? So roughly the same angle from the nearest cameras. You just overlap the images, and you get absolute garbage. It just does not work. Right? I mean, kind of intuitively, right? Like, unless the object is at infinity, it's actually going to have a slightly different location in the 2D raster uh, from, from camera to camera because of parallax. So how do you solve that? Well, the standard thing you do is you use a polygon model to hint at which light rays are actually closer in sort of an object space, right? Because you want to see, if you uh, want to find a light ray that's coming off the object point at this angle, um, then you want to go find where that object point hit the adjacent cameras. So in order to know that correlation, you need to have something like depth data or polygon data or point clouds. So I actually found a reference to this, recent methods for image-based modeling and rendering. Recent methods, circa 2003. And it was referencing the Lumograph paper by Stephen Gortler uh, in 1996. So I guess in retrospect, maybe standards bodies aren't moving all that aggressively fast after all. Uh, it's, only, it's only 20 years old. It's about on schedule, I guess. Um, and before I dive into the, the, the summary, I would just say that like, it's not clear to me that a 20-year-old standard is going to be the thing we're going to be using in 10 or 20 years. Right? I think that's my main sort of um, confusion about why we're standardizing right now, is that this has been out in the literature for 20 years, and I'm pretty sure we can do better than that. And I, I'm not going to say too much, but I have better than an intuition you can do better than that. Let's just say that. So anyway, in conclusion, uh, the future is holographic. Um, I keep saying that. I'm going to say it until it's true. Uh, we're all going to be watching video games in the future, definitely. Um, there, there may be some universal standards you can actually sign your name on and burn onto silicon. Um, there's probably going to be a few of them, uh, actually, not just, not just one or two. Um, otherwise, your TV is going to completely burn your house down. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that is basically the state of standards and capture. Um, light fields, volumetric. My company is Visby. We make light field technology. Um, that's capture, that's compression, that's delivery. So uh, I assume all of you will either be working on it, with it, um, you know, incorporating our tech into your much, 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 much larger companies in five or 10 years. Uh, 
Yeah. So uh, obviously I talk a lot faster when up in front of you all. I have some time for Q&A before Nick jumps on here. And Nick is already wired up for Q&A. So you're going to have to talk loudly if you want to get over, uh, over his voice. Now, I, I should confess, I assume that a larger percentage of the people here might have seen the last talk. How does everyone feel about VR and, and the volumetric stuff? We're all like, was that all completely Greek? Raise your hand if you're like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about and I'm too embarrassed to raise my hand. <laughs> Everyone, okay, great. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna answer the general question because um, there's lots of people doing things like this and that feels safer. Um, there's a lot of different techniques. My understanding is Microsoft and Intel both are likely using um, structured light. So there's the Intel, I think it's RealSense capture platform. That's a structured light. And then they've got IR cameras to pick up on the dots. Um, that's kind of necessary because one of the challenges in doing just sort of straightforward photographic optical flow, you know, structure from motion or structure from parallax is uh, large regions that don't have a lot of detail tend to kind of disappear or look really wonky, right? You don't have good correlations there. So a lot of people are augmenting their, their camera arrays with some other technology. Structure Light's one. Uh, I know Lytro for a while was using LiDAR. I don't know if that was ever in their, their production model or not. Um, and it is helpful to have some sort of approximate ground truth for depth um, and then do some sort of sensor fusion on it. And then there are groups that are doing pure computer vision, right? So you've got a whole lot of stereo correspondences. You can sort of infer depth to some degree there. And then, you know, if you do a good job, you get a great model. If you do a mediocre job, you get an awful model. If you do a bad job, you, uh, you go home. So, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, the practical data rate, I think, is like somewhere between 100 and 200 megabit um, because that's what it's going to be necessary for it to be practical. Now, are people going to get there? I, I don't know. I'm sure. <laughs> um, I think it's possible. So, uh, okay, I should probably unwind a bit. I think that carrying around the source images that came out of your camera array is preposterous. I just don't think that's an efficient way to carry image data around, right? Uh, there's no reason why the way you acquire it is exactly the way you should deliver it, given that everything's interpolated on the fly. So uh, I happen to have good authority. I didn't build it myself, but I've seen on good authority things have been done at my company where you use the source data and you generate a parametric model that is significantly smaller than the source images, and then that's what you distribute. And that's the future. The same way that video codecs are a bunch of mathematical, parametric mathematical models that then unpack and give you a pixel, we need to do the same thing for holographic data. Um, now, it's a hard problem. Um, I keep getting told that seemingly during every technology review, but, uh, but it's possible and we will crack it and that's, that's what the future of light fields actually is. Standards be damned. So, so you, you heard it here, 100 megabits to 200 megabits uh, and I'll have them take this video down if I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so it depends. Uh, I'm gonna actually show you the Google rig again because it's so fun. It's just, it's a little fun whirly gig of light field joy. Uh, 48 slides ago. There we go. So that's like, I don't know, was it 30 cameras or so? 30 or 40 cameras. Uh, but then it's, I think they're recording videos they spin around. So that's like the equivalent of like several thousand cameras. So I'd say it's an upper bound. You probably don't need several thousand cameras. Um, in practice, we find that it's very subject matter dependent, right? If you've got uh, not a lot of parallax, not a lot of objects that are, you know, uh, occluding each other, and a lot of stuff like far out like at infinity, you can get away with a relatively small number of cameras, you know, um, 20 or 30 probably. Um, in a previous talk I gave uh, at NAB, I sort of pointed out that the difference between a light field like this, with super dense capture, and uh, kind of a volumetric video game look like this is just a question of, of scale, right? If you've only got a few cameras to draw light rays from, it's functionally gonna look like a video game because every object point won't have specularity. So when you get down below about 20, in a particular region, uh, it starts to just look like a video game. Right, so the question is, what's the appropriate resolution today? Um, so the resolution of an individual camera in the array will set some sort of bound on your resolving power in the headset, right, or on the TV. So if you wanna display a two megapixel image, there's a big asterisk here, what I won't get into, but if you wanna show about a two megapixel image, you need roughly a two megapixel camera as the basis of your array. So that's gonna set your sort of, uh, your, your angular resolution. Uh, but then your, your spatial resolution, the number of cameras you've got is gonna affect how good your interpolation is, right? So, you know, if you have low resolution cameras, you're gonna get a soft light field. If you don't have enough cameras, you're gonna get garbage. And unfortunately, that's very subject matter dependent. Um, and, and what we've seen is, you know, the human face, I think is the most important thing. If you wanna capture video of people, that's kind of what people like to watch. Um, we find that 20 or 30 is a pretty good bound. You could probably go lower. Um, 
but somewhere in that range. So for 360, you'd need some panels with 20 or 30 cameras each minimum. Lytro had 90 some, I think. So, you know, we're talking dozens. We're not talking hundreds necessarily, as fun as that would be. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you actually have a little bit more information about where someone's going to go beyond just, um, uh, you know, in a VR headset. So a little background, if you're not familiar with the, the, the 360 video case, um, if you're streaming video down to someone who's wearing a, a VR headset, a Lingit 360 video, um, there's a lot of techniques where you don't necessarily need to send them very many pixels behind their head, right? Because they're not probably going to look there. Um, and if they whip around really fast, then you can kind of change midstream and show them a higher resolution feed there. Um, so I guess the question is, by analogy, if you're in a sixth off space, can you do something clever to kind of stream down the data that they want to see? And, and the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are not even close to streaming light fields right now. Um, so it's one of those like, beautiful idea, totally going to do it, put it on the shelf, return to it in 12 months and see if we're ready for it. But yeah, that, that's going to be part of the future for sure. It's not in the deck, but we'll, we'll let it slide. Yeah. Well, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.